The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Type Bond. My kids love to do crafts, and we've got a little craft cart that sits in our kitchen near the kitchen table where they could just grab what they need, bring it to the table, and theoretically put it back into the craft cart, which never actually happens. But Nicole had mentioned that this cart is a little bit top heavy. It's not really very stable. It's just a simple metal frame. There are no pull out drawers or anything where you could actually take something off of it and bring it to the table, which is part of the reason why it's a little bit harder to keep things organized there. And we looked at a few models online, and even the ones that have pull out bins tend to either be cheap plastic or cheap metal and it just looks very unstable so I was tasked with the challenge of building a new craft cart that would uh, suit the style that Nicole wants and also be something that would be much more functional. So what I'm thinking is a basic plywood box. This doesn't have to be anything fancy. Maybe a little bit of edge trim to protect that plywood edge. I've got some leftover milk paint, which is really just kind of a, a I think it's an acrylic uh, water-based paint that we can use. And we could put a nice finish over top of it and then a nice solid wood top just to really dress it up a little bit. I think it would look good where we need to keep it. And functionally speaking, it's gonna be a heck of a lot more sturdy than anything made out of plastic or thin metal tubing. So Nicole picked up these little bins that she likes. Obviously, she's a fan of very bright green, but it's for the kids, so it should be fun. They do come in different colors, and we'll put a link in the description in case you want to try one of the other colors. And I'm going to give you dimensions for this, but really, I want to show you how you arrive at those dimensions, because if you pick different baskets, uh, your cabinet is going to be a little bit different in size. So let's do just that. Let's take these and find out how big this cabinet needs to be. The bins flare out at the top, so I'll take my measurements from there. Next, I'll fire up SketchUp to mock it up. By the way, if you want to learn how to use SketchUp, we have an awesome course taught by a talented builder and designer, Brian Benham. It's available at the Wood Whisperer Guild. The course is even taught using the free web version of SketchUp, so there's no software to buy. Once I have the boxes in place, I can design the case around them. Each compartment will be a quarter inch bigger in each dimension to allow for some wiggle room. Now normally we can't really design furniture like this because we often have constraints in the space where the furniture is going to go. But since this cart is mobile and freestanding, we can pretty much design from the inside out, letting the bins completely dictate the final dimensions. All right, so we've got a pretty good representation of what we're going for here, certainly enough to break the parts out and then start to get our measurements so we can cut some plywood down. But especially on a project like this where it's just basic casework, I really do like to work out as many details as possible using a program like SketchUp. Um, on my more complex projects that are made of solid wood, you know, sometimes I'll use it, but I'll maybe get myself 25% of the way there digitally, and then I could take that information into the shop and apply it to actual work pieces. All right, so let's explode this drawing. Now, of course, when you look at this drawing, this looks very intimidating, but thankfully, if you apply a systematic approach, it just becomes a very simple series of steps. And something that I try to keep in mind when working with plywood projects is plywood is always undersized, right? It's usually about a 32nd, and well, I, honestly, it's variable from sheet to sheet in different manuals manufacturers. So when I draw this thing, I call everything three quarters of an inch, but the reality is it's a little bit smaller than that. So how do we account for that? Well, sometimes you need to be much more careful about it, but in this case, I gave each compartment a little bit of breathing room. There's a quarter inch above and a quarter inch to the side, which means if these pieces got just a little bit smaller, it's not going to hurt anything. Maybe the gap closes a little bit, but it's not a big deal, right? So that's always something you want to keep in mind with plywood projects. I like to cut my plywood on the floor like some kind of monster, using a track saw. By the way, this plywood cart really turned out to be a great addition to the shop. If you're pressed for space, it's a pretty good solution. So now I'll just lay out my parts and get to cutting. I leave most of my parts oversized for now. If you don't have a track saw, a circular saw, and a clamping tool guide, or a straight piece of plywood will get the job done. Slow, dramatic walk. Yeah. By the way, if you're a fan of hot or cold liquids, and who isn't, check out the TWW Fuel Mugs. Now, one thing that can really trip up new woodworkers, I know it was an issue for me when I was first starting out, is knowing what to cut when. So if we take our top, our bottom, and our two sides, we sort of have the outer frame. And then a bunch of stuff has to fit inside that. So you kind of have to take it step by step to make sure you don't cut your parts too short accidentally. And if you just follow the numbers in a plan, that's certainly something that could happen. So what I'm gonna do is for this middle divider, I'm gonna use math on this one. This is one that we actually can use math if we cut our joints in a very specific way. 
When we cut this center dado on the top and bottom, you have two ways you could approach it. We just basically would call this a quarter inch deep dado. But because this piece is less than three quarters of an inch, if I cut this to a quarter inch, what's left over is probably gonna be something of an odd fraction. So instead of doing that, I'm going to cut this notch, this dado here, so that what it leaves me with is an exact half inch. And if I do that, then I know I have a nice even number here. I basically take the length of the side, subtract a half inch here, subtract a half inch down here, and that's the length of my center divider. So that is one case where we can use math. But when it comes to the shelves inside here, too many variables at this point to call that number. So what I'm gonna do is make sure we get everything else cut, get all those joints cut, then we can dry assemble, bring it together, and then take the measurement from the project itself at something we call relative dimensioning. So now I'll cut my sides, top, bottom, and center divider to length and width. When cross-cutting pieces like this, you do need to be careful. The longer the piece gets, the more there's a tendency for it to rotate and cause kickback. But if you keep good balance pressure, you should be fine for the top and bottom pieces. The sides, however, are just too long to cross-cut safely like this, so I'll use a miter gauge that isn't really a miter gauge to help control the work pieces during the cut. The front edge of each piece of plywood will be covered with a strip of solid edge banding, and I'll cut those at the bandsaw. The strips can then be planed or sanded smooth after the cut. The edge banding is slightly wider than the plywood thickness, and that's intentional. We'll flush that up later. Even though some of the pieces aren't cut to final dimension yet, I'll still trim out the front edges. To attach the banding, I'll use Type On 2. I don't really need the water resistance here, but this is the glue that I have the most of in the shop right now, so I want to use it up. Though I do have two young kids, so this thing could eventually be soaked in all kinds of fluids. There are a couple ways that you can tackle attaching solid edge banding. One is to use these fancy bandy clamps. These things are great, but they're not exactly cheap. They provide a surprising amount of pressure while the grippy pads hold firm to the panel. A second way is to use masking tape. If you carefully stretch the tape over the edge, you can apply fairly consistent pressure along the strip. And the third way is probably the most fun because you get to shoot stuff, and that's using a brad nailer. It's fast and easy, but has the drawback of making holes that need to be filled. And there they are, all trimmed out and no place to go. Since the trim sits proud of the surface, we do need to trim it flush. You can do this carefully by hand with a block plane and a sanding block, or you can use a router and a flush trim bit. It takes some practice to balance the router on the edge, and if you're not comfortable doing that, don't. Clamp some scrap to the board instead and use that for extra support. The ends are then trimmed flush, and the surface is sanded smooth. If you see any hairline gaps, contemplate your choices in life and how you ended up in this situation, and then smack them in the face with some filler. Now I can lay out my rabbits and dados in the sides. For the dados, instead of making start and stop points for each dado, I like to mark the center. I can then use a piece of scrap from the project, line up the center marks, and draw pencil lines that represent the true start and stop edges of the dado. I prefer this system as it pretty much takes the thickness of the plywood out of the equation. I can then extend those cut lines with a really expensive square. I'm making jokes, but having a dead-on accurate square of this size is totally worth it in my opinion. On the top and bottom, we need a center dado for the center divider, and we'll use the same center point system to lay it out. Down on your knees. At the table saw, I run a quick test to make sure that my dado stack is set to the correct width, and that looks pretty good. A super tight fit here would mean that we'd have trouble when assembling later with glue, so a little movement in the joint is a good thing. For the rabbits on the ends, I'll employ a sacrificial fence, I'll then dial in the height of the blade so that it leaves me with exactly a half inch of material after the cut. This piece of scrap is plain to exactly a half inch, so it makes it easy to tell if the leftover material is the right thickness. Now I'll cut the rabbits in the top and bottom of the side panels. Next, I'll cut the dados. The sides are essentially mirror images of one another, so we'll cut both side pieces with each fence setting. Now, this center divider gets the exact same dado layout as the sides, but we can't cut them with the same fence setting because we have that little half inch down here and a half inch up there, so it's slightly offset. Well, one cool trick to be able to do this is because we know we cut these to leave a half inch at the other side of that dado, we can actually use a half inch spacer. And with the fence in the same setting as we use to cut this, 
we add a half inch spacer there to cut this one. And then we move on to the next one. Set it with the fence and then we use a spacer again to cut the center divider. Just a cool trick to make sure everything is laid out perfectly with the fewest fence moves possible. So the spacer is working great, but check out this boner move. I was so excited about the half inch shim that I totally forgot that the center divider needs dados on both faces. So I was able to get the last cut done using the fence setting, but I'll need to reset the fence as accurately as I can for the rest of the dados. This kind of trashes my whole system of dummy proof accuracy, but what are you going to do? Now I can cut the dados in the top and the bottom, as well as the rabbits that'll accept the back panel. With the case dry assembled, I can take the measurements for the shelves. Now be careful here, because there's totally a chance that the top and bottom dados aren't perfectly centered from left to right, and then your left and right shelf sets will be slightly different. So sneak up on the fit, get it perfect. Now we can do the assembly. I'll use glue and 18 gauge brad nails. I'll also make use of clamping squares to help keep the assembly square. And that's really your biggest concern at this point. You know, a big misconception about plywood is that it always stays flat. I mean, it can stay flat, but depending on the quality of the material and the conditions it's stored in, plywood can and will warp. So when you do assemblies, you have to watch out for that. You can usually counteract any wonkiness with clamps and by making sure that all of the joints are bottoming out. For the interior shelves, I want a little bit more working time just in case I need to make adjustments, so I'll use Type Bond Extend. To get all those dados to seat properly, it's a good idea to use some clamps. And not that I can do anything about it now, but it's a good idea to test the fit of the baskets. Whew, they fit. And don't forget to cover up any shoddy work and fill the nail holes. Now for the back panel, I'll simply measure and cut a half inch panel to size. I won't be gluing this in just yet, we'll do that after finishing. It's going to be much easier to finish the interior of this thing without a back panel in place. Next I'll do a little bit of sanding and ease the edges with a small round over. And now for the solid wood top, which will be a simple walnut panel. I resaw a larger board in half and bring the pieces down to three quarters of an inch when what to my wondering eyes should appear? A spot of rust on my cast iron that should not be here. Mm. Nothing a little WD-40 and a coat of wax won't fix. Now back to the top. The two halves are glued together using some type bond dark. Now if you work with uh, dark woods a lot, the dark formula is great for making your glue lines even less noticeable. By the way, if you want more tips and tricks for making flat panels, check out this video I did a few years ago. The panel is then sanded smooth and cut to final size. I also want a nice little curve at the front for some style points, so I'll draw it, cut it, and route it. Hard wax oil will be my finish of choice for the walnut. People always ask me, Mark, why do you use so much walnut? Well, this is why. Look at that gorgeous color when it's hit with an oil. It's really the best. Okay, we need to have a, a little woodworker heart to heart here. Uh, at this point, I've painted myself into a corner, pun intended. Um, I'm sort of staring down the barrel of a interior finishing process that I'm really not going to enjoy. This is not a surprise. I knew this is what I was setting myself up for. When you have cubbies like this, you probably should be thinking about pre-finishing. But the problem with pre-finishing is once I apply coats of paint and then a clear coat on top of that, uh, putting this thing together becomes a nightmare because now the pieces are actually a little bit thicker. Uh, and when you bang them into, uh, you know, these dados, you may actually wind up scraping that finish and then it bunches up and it, it just creates all kinds of problems. So this was one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I know it's going to be a pain in the butt to finish it once it's assembled, but uh, that's tomorrow Mark's problem. Well, tomorrow is now today. And I'm looking at this thinking, I don't think I want to paint it. Furthermore, 
the actual results of this process of using this inexpensive plywood is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I expected all my corners to have burn through. I was pretty aggressive about how I built this and I was building it for paint. I was not building it for a clear coat. Yet I ended up with something that really doesn't look that bad. And in the end, this paint color I was gonna go with, linen, I mean, you guys can see from here, that color is really not all that different than the color of this plywood uh, with that, um, I guess this is like a birch surface that's on there. Uh, so I'm, I'm really having trouble at this point justifying going through the extra work of multiple coats, sanding between coats, and then a top coat on all this interior space when I probably could just go with a top coat and my wife would be just as happy with it and it would look just as good from a distance. I do have some issues with some of the filler that I used for my brad nail holes. Normally I would not do something like that if I could avoid it, um, but at this point, <laughs> there sometimes are points in projects where you just have to go, is it worth it for this? In this case, no. And frankly, some of you who are anti-paint are probably uh, applauding right now because this thing is going to have wood grain instead of just a uh, bland sort of painted surface. Um, so in the end, I think it's gonna look just as good. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna fully um, admit that this is a bit of a cop out, but this is what I'm doing. Let's get to it. So I used an oil for the top, but now I'm using a water-based top coat for the case. Why? Well, if I use oil on the birch plywood, it's gonna turn it yellow. Some people like that look, and in certain situations, I might like it too. But in this case, I'm really looking to emulate the look that we would have achieved with that linen color paint. So it's best to use a water-based top coat that won't yellow. That way I can keep the piece closer to the natural creamy color of birch. I'll sand the first coat with 220, and then apply a second coat. Once that dries, I can attach the top, and the attachment will just be screws up through the case and into the walnut. By the way, a cordless brad nailer might just get my award for the most fun tool in the shop. And now for the casters, which are just screwed into the bottom. All right, let's get these things in there. I'm uh, proud to introduce to you guys the new Festool craft cart. They do make these in other colors. Maybe I'll sneak an order in before Nicole notices. But hey, it's fun, it's for the kids. I'm missing one. All right, well, I don't know where the last one is. I'm gonna have to look around for that, but this definitely does exactly what we needed it to do. The real question, which I don't have the answer to yet, is how this is going to work in that kitchen area that we have. Will this actually be more organized? I don't know. These things are always great in theory, but we'll see how it actually works out. But this is what Nicole asked for. And that's what she's getting. Let's get this thing into the house and uh, we'll load it up. <laughs> you need some help? You want a lighter one? Yeah. Cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. 